Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the serotonin, also known as the 5-hydroxytryptamine receptors. Okay, so we've seen now that uh, the receptors for serotonin can be split into these seven families, okay? And six of these families contain receptors which are G-protein coupled receptors, whilst one of them, the third family, contains receptors which are ligand-gated ion channels, which we'll come back to at the end, okay? But for now, what I want to discuss is uh, G-protein coupled receptors. I want to discuss how they work and um, which heterotrimeric G-proteins each of the uh, families of serotonin receptors couples through. Okay, so G-protein coupled receptors, which are for short, often abbreviated to GPCRs. Okay, right. So we'll start off with a discussion of the general structure of G-protein coupled receptors, and then we'll look at the categorization of G-protein coupled receptors into five families and see which family all of our serotonin receptors, which are G-protein coupled receptors, fall into. Okay, so G-protein coupled receptors is the largest, well, one of the largest family of proteins known, okay? There are over 800 G-protein coupled receptors in the human body alone, okay? So not counting all the other animals on this planet, there are 800 of the things just in humans, okay? 800 different types, okay? And the common feature that they all uh, have is seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. So they start with their amino termini extracellularly, then they have their first membrane-spanning alpha helix, the second membrane-spanning alpha helix, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and then the seventh, and then they finish with their carboxylic acid terminus intracellularly. Okay, right. So let's highlight on some special features here and do a little bit of nomenclature. So we have these seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, and it still isn't really understood what is so special about having seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. But nature seems to have latched onto this seven membrane-spanning alpha helix structure and run with it, basically. And we don't fully understand why it's so useful. Okay, right. So the naming, then, for these seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. The first one is called the transmembrane domain 1, so TM1. The second one is known as transmembrane region 2, or transmembrane domain 2, whatever you want to call it, TM2. The third one is TM3, the fourth one is TM4, the fifth one is TM5, the sixth one is TM6, and then the seventh one is TM7. Okay, so that's the way that we name up the seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. We also give names to these loops that you have between the membrane-spanning alpha helices, three of which are on the intracellular aspect and are now being highlighted in pink, okay? These are called the intracellular loops, okay? And for short, the intracellular loops are often abbreviated to ICL, okay? So I for intra, C for cellular, and then L for loop. So we have the first intracellular loop, ICL1, between TM1 and TM2. We then have the second intracellular loop, ICL2, between the third and fourth membrane-spanning alpha helices. We then have the third uh, intracellular loop, ICL3, between the fifth and sixth membrane-spanning alpha helices. Okay, right. Now let's move over to the extracellular loops. Okay, so we also have these three loops extracellularly, which are in orange here. Okay, so these are the extracellular loops. And for short, the extracellular loops are often abbreviated to ECLs. Okay, E for extra, C for cellular, and then L for loop. Okay, so ECLs for extracellular loops. Okay, so this is the structure, uh, the general structure of a G-protein coupled receptor. Now, because there are 800 G-protein coupled receptors in the human body, it uh, becomes helpful for our understanding to group them into families based on uh, structural um, facts about them.
Okay, so G protein coupled receptors are often divided into five families, and I'd like to discuss these five families now. So we'll start with family number one. Okay, so family number one is called the rhodopsin family because uh, the uh, receptor rhodopsin, which responds to light, uh, is within this family, and it's a very notable member and a very highly studied member. Okay, so rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors. So this is by far the biggest family of G-protein coupled receptors. Around 750 of the known 800 G-protein coupled receptors are grouped into this rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors. So what structural uh, facts do they all share uh, that um, groups them all together, okay, links them all? Well, basically, uh, they all have rather small extracellular domains, okay? So the amino terminus here is rather small. Uh, then they have their first membrane-spanning alpha helix, and then it's the conserved structure, okay, like so. So here are the seven membrane-spanning alpha helices with the free intracellular loops and the free extracellular loops. And then they have their carboxylic acid tail, okay? Now, the special thing about rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors is where they bind their ligand. Basically, the ligand of rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors binds to amino acid residues which are in the transmembrane domains. Okay? So, it will bind in this region here, in the transmembrane region, and it will be in the outer third of the transmembrane region. Now, I've shown it, you know, this pink blob is supposed to represent the ligand. I've shown it as though it's binding specifically to the third and fourth membrane-spanning alpha helice. In reality, you know, that will vary uh, where exactly it binds to. But the point is that it's binding to residues that are within the seven transmembrane regions, basically. Okay, right, so that's the characteristic feature of the rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors, that they bind their ligand, and I might just label up the ligand here, it's the pink blob there, uh, they bind their ligand in the transmembrane region. Okay, now most G-protein coupled receptors fall into this family. There's around 750 rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors. All of our serotonin receptors fall into this category. Okay, so all of these serotonin receptors, which are G-protein coupled receptors, of course, not the 5-HG3 receptors, which are ligand-gated ion channels, will come to those, but all of the others, all the other six families, these all fall into this category. Okay, now, for completeness, I just want to contrast this to the other four families. Okay, so I'm going to continue on with my discussion of the uh, G-protein coupled receptors just for completeness. Okay, so, let's move on now to the second family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so the second family of G-protein coupled receptors is what's known as the secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, now, uh, the secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors generally contains receptors which bind to a peptide ligand, and they also bind this peptide ligand in a very characteristic way, which I'm going to discuss now. Okay, so they have larger amino terminal domains that are extracellular, and then they have this conserved region here, with the seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, like so, and then they have their carboxylic acid terminus down here. So that means that the amino terminus, as always, is extracellularly. Now, secretin family G-protein coupled receptors generally bind their ligand in a sort of uh, pocket between the uh, amino terminal domain and the transmembrane domain. So you find that there's this sort of pocket sitting between these two portions and the ligand binds, slips in in between the two basically. Okay, so that's the characteristic feature that the secretin family G-protein coupled receptors have. So let me give you some examples of secretin family G-protein coupled receptors. So, the receptors for parathyroid hormone, the PTH receptors, these are all secretin family G-protein coupled receptors. The receptors for calcitonin, 
okay, also involved in the regulation of blood calcium level. These are all secretin family G protein coupled receptors. Also, the receptors for glucagon, very important in control of blood glucose level, uh, these are also secretin family G protein coupled receptors. And you'll notice that all of these ligands, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin and glucagon, they're all peptides, they're all proteins basically. Okay, they're not small little molecules like serotonin. Okay, right. So, that's the second family of G-protein coupled receptors. Let's now move on to the third family of G-protein coupled receptors. So, the third family of G-protein coupled receptors is the glutamate family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, and you might be able to guess examples of receptors which fall into this glutamate family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so the characteristic feature which you have to have in order to be considered a glutamate family G protein coupled receptor is that you have to have a very characteristic uh, ligand binding domain. Okay, so once again, here's the amino terminus. Let's draw the cell membrane here. Okay, then we've got the characteristic seven membrane spanning alpha helices here. And basically, the um, characteristic feature that all of these uh, glutamate family G protein coupled receptors have is that they have a venous flytrap like domain okay or just a venous flytrap domain rather than having the like there okay which is what uh, let me highlight it in this thing here is supposed to represent Okay, so this is supposed to be my uh, drawing of a venous flytrap domain. And basically the idea is that the ligand will bind in here, and when it binds, the thing will close around it. So venous flytrap plants, just in case you don't know, have uh, a sort of enclosure basically that lures insects inside, and then when the insects come in, the entrance to the enclosure closes basically and traps the insect in there and then the plant uh, digests the insect. So basically um, what happens is the ligand will come into this venous flytrap domain and then uh, the two portions there will close around it and trap it in basically. Okay, so that's how these glutamate family G protein coupled receptors bind their ligand. Okay, so what examples uh, of G protein coupled receptors are in this family of glutamate family G protein coupled receptors? Well, a big family of um, receptors which are in this glutamate family uh, are the MGLUARs, okay, which are the metabotropic glutamate receptors. Now remember, most of the glutamate receptors that you have in the brain are ionotropic glutamate receptors. They are ligand-gated ion channels. The AMPA receptors, the kinate receptors, the NMDA receptors, these are all ligand-gated ion channels, not G-protein coupled receptors. However, you do have uh, a, a whole family of G-protein coupled receptor glutamate receptors, and these are called the metabotropic glutamate receptors, or for short, they're often abbreviated to MGLUARs, and there are eight metabotropic glutamate receptors labelled MGLUR1, MGLUR2, all the way up to MGLUR8. Okay, so those all fall into this family. You also have uh, another important family here, which is the GABA-B receptors. So this is very actually similar to the MGLUARs because glutamate is the most important excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, but most of the receptors for it are ionotropic. GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid is the most important inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And again, most of the receptors are ionotropic. They are uh, ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, The GABA-A receptors is a huge, great family of ligand-gated ion channels which open and allow chloride anions into the cell. Okay, uh, And those are the receptors which benzodiazepines work on. Uh, however, there is this other family of receptors for gamma aminobutyric acid, which are the GABA-B receptors, and these are all G-protein coupled receptors. And all of these G-protein coupled receptors fit into this family of glutamate uh, family G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so that's quite analogous to the MGLUARs then. Okay, so the fourth family then of G-protein coupled receptors. 
The fourth family of G-protein coupled receptors is the adhesion family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, and these are quite odd G-protein coupled receptors because they don't bind your sort of typical idea of a ligand. Instead, they bind to components of the extracellular matrix. So if we have the cell membrane here, what they tend to have is very large extracellular domains, okay? So here is their amino terminus, and then they'll have a very, very large extracellular domain, like so. Then they'll have to have the characteristic seven membrane spanning alpha helices. Without those, they wouldn't be viewed as a G protein coupled receptor. Okay, here is the uh, carboxylic acid terminus, and then this very large extracellular domain will bind to components of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so this sort of rectangle here, colored in purple, this is going to represent some sort of component of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so that's the adhesion family of G-protein coupled receptors. They're involved in binding to extracellular matrix components. Okay, so one final family then, and we've discussed all the families of the G-protein coupled receptors. So the final family of G-protein coupled receptors is the family with the silliest name, basically, okay? The final family of G-protein coupled receptors, family number five, is called the frizzled slash taste two family of G-protein coupled receptors. So frizzled slash taste two receptors, okay? Or taste two family of receptors, rather. Uh, and it's named after the two major members of this family, which are the frizzled receptor and the taste 2 receptor. Okay, and this family really contains all of the receptors that don't fit into any of the other families. Okay, so they have reasonably large amino terminal domains. Okay, so here's the amino group extracellularly, and then they have the characteristic seven membrane spanning alpha helices here with their carboxylic acid terminus intracellularly, and then they bind their ligand extracellularly, but they don't do it in any of the interesting ways that the other ones did. So they don't have a venous flytrap domain, therefore they're not glutamate family G protein coupled receptors. Uh, they don't bind it in that wedge between the extracellular domain and the transmembrane domain, therefore they're not secretin family. Uh, they don't bind to extracellular matrix components, so they're not adhesion family. And the final one, the rhodopsin family, bounded in the transmembrane domain, so they're certainly not uh, rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors. So they just bind their ligand extracellularly, basically, within the amino terminal domain. Okay, so uh, the two key members then are the frizzled receptor, uh, the wint, uh, sorry, the ligand for which is wint, okay? And of course, frizzled is very important in the wint beta catenin pathway. Okay, the other key re example is the taste 2 receptor, often just abbreviated to T2R. Okay, and this is involved in the tasting of bitter molecules within the gustatory system. Okay, right, so that concludes our discussion of the five different families of G-protein coupled receptors. What we'll do in the next video is we'll discuss the G-protein cycle and then we'll discuss the many different types of heterotrimeric G-proteins.